Whether they're meant to give us clues about season 3, or to simply give us all a reason to rewatch once we're done with our first binge, here are some of the small details you probably missed in the Umbrella Academy's second season. Spoiler warning for season 2 of the Umbrella Academy. At the end of season 2, the time-traveling team successfully returns to 2019, only to learn the Umbrella Academy seems to have been replaced with the Sparrow Academy, apparently led by a not-so-dead Ben. I'm just happy that we're home and together again. Home? This isn't your home. These sparrows aren't the only birds flying around the second season, though. While you may not notice them before the Sparrow Academy reveal, the official Umbrella Academy Instagram page posted that there are exactly 43 sparrows in Season 2. A significant number since there were said to be exactly 43 superpowered children born on October 1st, 1989 in the show's mythology. Perhaps the easiest example to remember is Harlan's Sparrow Toy, which we see him levitating in the back seat of his mother's car towards the end of the finale. In a light supper, eagle-eyed viewers can spot a Sparrow logo on the piece of paper the handler gives Five with the location of the commission's executive board, a logo that mysteriously disappears when Five looks at it in the following episode. Other examples of Sparrow logos show up on the dairy truck the Swedish assassin steal, on the front door of the liquor store that Klaus visits, on the room service menu Lila looks at, and on yet another on a piece of paper in Old Man Five's briefcase. We haven't discovered them all yet, but the prospect of finding them isn't a bad motivation to rewatch Season 2. One of the biggest surprises in the Season 2 finale is a crazy reveal that Lila is one of the superpowered children born in 1989, just like the seven members of the Umbrella Academy. Similar to Mimic of Marvel Comics' X-Men, Lila can use other people's powers to her own advantage, and we see her gift on full display at the Cooper's farm. While at first it looks like the Academy has slam-dunked the commission in the season finale, Lila is able to use their powers to even the playing field. How are you doing this? Oh, anything that you can do, I can do better. But what you may not realize is this isn't the first time in this series that she's used her powers. At the end of the episode Valhalla, she fights Five in a factory, and the melee ends with Five's foot on her throat and with the handler revealing herself. However, three times during their fight, Five expects Lila to be one place and she appears in another. Initially, we're supposed to assume she's just unbelievably sneaky and fast, but when you rewatch the scene with the knowledge of Lila's superpower, it becomes clear she's mirroring Five's teleportation. The camera isn't on her when she uses it, so we never see the ripple effect, thus keeping her power a secret until the big showdown. In the Swedish job, we get a quick look at an unnamed character who's a pretty clear reference to one of the most acclaimed graphic novels of all time, Watchmen. Just after Luther starts off on a morning jog outside his rooming house, an elderly man carrying a placard reading The End Is Nigh appears and starts walking in the opposite direction. So what's the reference here? Well, carrying a placard that warns of the end of the world is just about all the vigilante Rorschach seems to do in Watchmen when he's out of costume. And while the man in the Swedish job doesn't look at all like Rorschach, with his long hair and full beard, he does have a passing resemblance to Alan Moore, the author of Watchmen. And it's a fitting reference for a couple of reasons. For one, just as the escalating tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union provide Ozymandias motivations in Watchmen, it's an apocalyptic conflict between these two superpowers that Five is struggling to avoid in the Umbrella Academy. For another, just like Watchmen's Ozymandias, Five employs some pretty reprehensible tactics in saving the world like traveling to 1982 and assassinating most of the commission's executive board with an axe, paving the way for the handler's takeover of the organization. She said you, didn't she? Does it really matter now? In the show's first season, we met Pogo, a sophisticated chimpanzee butler with human intelligence who was sadly killed by Vanya. If you've ever wondered about the ape's origin story, the second season has got your answers. Valhalla opens with a flashback of the younger Pogo as part of an early project to see how chimpanzees would be affected by spaceflight and, by extension, what might be in store for human pilots. And two episodes later in Ugga for Ugga, there's an easy-to-miss detail that could point to Pogo being much more famous than we realized. When Five travels to 1982 Wisconsin to kill the commission's executive board, he stops at a vending machine for a candy bar. The one he winds up with is called a Fudge Nutter, but right next to that bar is one called Pogo Gogos, and above the name on the wrapper it reads, Take Flight With. It's a small detail, but it says a lot. For Pogo to have a candy bar named after him suggests the intelligent chimp was much more of a space-age icon than we realized. In the season premiere, while all the members of the Umbrella Academy arrive in the same place, they don't arrive in the same year. Oh, they're gone. They're gone like a fart in the wind. 
They fought from the portal into the same Dallas alley, one at a time, or two in the case of Klaus and the Ghost of Ben, between 1960 and 1963. Interestingly, right across the street from the alley is a movie theater, and in at least three cases, the theater marquee is advertising a very specific kind of movie. When Klaus and the Ghost of Ben appear in 1960, the marquee is advertising the 1959 film Curse of the Undead. As Allison arrives in 1961, the theater is apparently caught up with its releases, and the marquee announces that year's The Curse of the Werewolf. The marquee during Luther's arrival in 1962 isn't really visible enough to read, but the same film is playing during Diego's appearance in 1963, when Vanya shows up a month after Diego, and when Five arrives in November 1963, The Kiss of the Vampire. Of course, in Fife's case, the fighting between the US and Soviet forces have blown most of the letters off the marquee, and we doubt the theater is still selling tickets at that point. It may be that the marquees are meant to reflect the heroes' collective doubt expressed throughout the season about whether or not they're heroes, superpowered freaks, or, as the marquees reflect, monsters. In other words, it's not exactly the kind of thing you want to see when you're suddenly lost in the past and struggling with self-esteem issues. In the Umbrella Academy comics, the hero's hometown is left intentionally ambiguous. In fact, it's referred to only as The City. But it looks like Season 2 of the series has revealed the location of the Academy's HQ, at least as far as a TV adaptation is concerned. In a flashback in Valhalla, we learn that as soon as he could, Luther gets on a Greyhound bus in the hopes that he can find his father. During the trip, there's an overlay revealing the bus's progress on the map, showing that Luther gets off somewhere in or around Indianapolis. It's an interesting choice for a superhero HQ. Maybe the writers simply didn't want yet one more superhero team hailing from the Big Apple. Maybe it just seemed far enough away from Dallas to be a long trip, but not too long. Or maybe Reginald Hargreaves is a big basketball fan and just wanted to be near the Hoosiers. When it comes to powers, Diego has a pretty unique skill set. The dude is a master of knives, able to make blades spin through the air with the greatest of ease and fly in any direction he chooses. In the season finale, however, Diego uses his powers in a way that we've never seen before. When the Commission's goons are firing on him and Five, Diego buys Five the time he needs to make it to the house by jumping out from behind cover and stopping the hail of bullets mid-air, a la Neo from The Matrix. Speaking to Den of Geek, showrunner Stephen Blackman said that this is an extension of the powers we've already seen before, explaining, If you think about Diego's power, he can, with his mind, control the trajectory of objects. Basically, he likes throwing so he can throw his knife, and he can make it go in weird, odd curvatures and directions. Blackman went on to say that the aftermath of Ben's death hurt the chances that most of the members of the Umbrella Academy would reach their power's full potential early on, and that fans should expect for the heroes to keep learning more about their abilities. Everybody wants to see powers all of a sudden. Looking back on Season 2, we've already seen some of that. For example, before Season 2, Klaus has no idea it's possible for a ghost to possess him, and when spectral cowboys save him from falling in the season finale, he seems as surprised by it as anyone else. Likewise, even before she lost her memory, Vanya had no idea she could use her powers to resuscitate someone, as she does with Harlan after he drowns, or that doing so would transfer her powers to him. With every episode, the Umbrella Academy grows stronger and stronger, and we can't wait to see what weird directions their powers will go. One of the potential differences between the Umbrella Academy show and the comics is that in the source material, Diego has the ability to hold his breath indefinitely. So far, we haven't seen the power expressed in the TV series. Or have we? A Reddit user going by the name High Arcanist noticed something strange in a funny scene. In A Light Supper, the Academy members all cram into an elevator on their way to meet with their father. Nobody is exactly looking forward to the meeting and at least one of the heroes is especially anxious. During the trip up, almost everybody on the elevator reacts in surprise and disgust as, we soon learn, Luther experiences some unpleasant flatulence. But there's one person who doesn't react as negatively as the rest, Diego. While everyone else is scowling and covering their mouths and noses, Diego is smiling, seeming amused at the whole thing. At no point does he seem to be suffering from the stench as his brothers and sisters are. The High Arcanist believes it's because the Diego of the show shares the breath-holding ability of his comic book counterpart, and so he's able to avoid most of the negative aspects of the experience and enjoy the discomfort of his adoptive siblings. It certainly seems possible, though it could also be that Diego just has a stronger stomach for his brother's nervousness. In the seven stages, Five enlists Luther's help to do something that he warns is very dangerous, to contact an earlier version of himself. Doing this, Five warns, is incredibly risky because of what he calls paradox psychosis, which is a kind of psychosis a person may undergo when encountering themselves in another time. There are seven stages of paradox psychosis, and we watch both Five and Old Man Five go through all those stages. You just itched your neck. That's stage two of paradox psychosis. No, I didn't. I didn't itch my neck. Then I was stage one.
It's possible we see someone else go through them earlier in the season. Two of the seven stages are excessive gas and homicidal rage, and in A Light Supper, we see Luther exhibit both, on the elevator and at dinner with their father. Look at what you did to me! Look at it! And that kind of anger, especially directed at his dad, is pretty unusual for our hulking hero. Blackman is said to expect things in Season 2 to hint toward the future. Could it be that another Luther, maybe one from a future season, is lurking somewhere nearby? Of course, that would lead to the question of why he isn't exhibiting the other symptoms. Although, it could be that wherever the future Luther is hiding, perhaps he isn't as close to the 1963 Luther as the fives were to each other or for quite as long. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.